Welcome to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We give voice to those who challenge a prevailing sentiment in global financial markets. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests were not compensated for their appearance, nor do they supply payment in order to appear. Individuals on this podcast may hold positions in the securities that are discussed. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. This podcast episode may have ads and the occasional announcement. To listen without ads or announcements and take advantage of a host of other benefits, consider becoming a premium subscriber. Prices start at $9 per month. Visit the website contrarian.supercast.tech. That's T-E-C-H for more information. Now, here's your host, Mr. Nathaniel E. Baker. This podcast episode was recorded in two parts. The first back in February, and then on Tuesday, March 14th, I went back to the guest to add a segment in light of what had happened to the banks the previous weekend. Referring here, of course, to Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank of New York. And I really wanted to get the guest's views on these particular issues because he had worked at the Fed and because he was familiar with the type of lending facilities that had been made available. And I got that information and it was released, that second conversation was released to premium subscribers the same day it was recorded. This is one of the many benefits of being a premium subscriber. You get an actionable highlights clip from the podcast episode, either the day it's recorded, if it's timely like this was, or within a day or two. So premium membership has its privileges, and you can sign up to become a premium member at the website mentioned at the top, contrarian.supercast.com, or on our substack, contrarianpod.substack.com. Dot com. Prices and benefits are exactly the same at both websites. So check it out, contrarian.supercast.com or contrarianpod.substack.com. Now, here is the podcast. Enjoy. Jacob Schirmeyer, Portfolio Manager with Multi-Asset Solutions at Harbor Capital. Thank you so much for joining the Contrarian Investor Podcast today. It's great to have you. We are going to talk about the Fed, and you are in a great position to talk about this because you were there. You worked at the Fed. We usually leave the individual's background, professional background, for the second half of the show, but in light of everything that we are going to be discussing, I wanted to start with that. And maybe you can just start a little bit and tell us what you did at the Fed and then we'll talk about this whole idea of quantitative tightening and how much longer it may have to go. So over to you. Great. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, it's thanks great to be joining on. you and discussing a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So in terms of my background, I spent several years at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York on their open markets trading desk, so within the Treasury markets team. And so what that area is responsible for is, one, implementing monetary policy. So that was engaging in all the QE, the QT, and then the COVID uh, response, as well as kind of informing policymakers about what's going on in the Treasury market. What does it say about expectations for Fed policy? What does it say about the term structure of inflation expectations? What does it say about the market structure of the Treasury market writ large? Who's buying? Who's selling? How do you understand that? And Hang in, on in there. Addition, I gotta, let me yeah. cut you off right there because – we often hear that the Fed doesn't care about markets, but it sounds that they, and maybe that's true for stock markets, but you're telling us now they do care about treasury markets. They do. They care deeply about the treasury market, money markets, the MBS market, so the, the areas sure. where they're okay. most active in. And then they care more broadly about financial markets insofar as it informs their understanding of how much policy tightening is going on in this yeah. in the current regime, in previous regimes, how much easing is going on. Financial markets and financial conditions are how they transmit policy by and large to the real economy. And so you know, what do equity multiples, what do equity valuations tell you about 
investors' risk preferences? What do credit spreads tell you about the cost of funding for businesses? Things sure. like that. Okay. So the Fed cares deeply about financial. Of course. Okay. Sorry. So go, to go on then. So you're on the on the Treasury Open Market Desk, and you you were there for a couple of cycles, right? When did you start? And what year was that? Yeah. So I was fortunate to kind of get the whole life cycle. So I started towards the the fall of 2015. And so that was right before they were lifting off zero, which happened in December of that year. So after the financial crisis, of course, rates had been floored for around seven years. And so I was there right when they were um, pulling interest rates off the floor. And kind of the novel aspects of that at the time is they'd never done that with a very large balance sheet, which mm-hmm. obviously was a result of QE. And so there was a lot of discussion and you know um, uncertainty about how interest rate pass through would work in a world where you had a much larger balance sheet. So kind of fast forward a few years, they start running down that balance sheet in 2017. And so again, another kind of first pass through the post in the sense that they had never run down the balance sheet because of course they'd never done QE prior to the financial crisis. And this globally, it really hadn't been done either. The Bank of Japan had experimented kind of in the 2001, 2006 range, but no large central bank had really tried to run down their balance sheet to the extent that the Fed was beginning in 2017. So we went through that for the next two years. We of course ran into a little bit of repo volatility in September of 2019. That caused the Fed to reverse course start growing the balance sheet again to kind of increase the level of reserves. That lasted for a few months. And then, of course, COVID hit March of 2020. And then all hell broke loose. And we started increasing the balance sheet dramatically again in order to improve market functioning, provide accommodation, and you know, by and large, backstop the financial markets. So the question now, as we record this on Tuesday, March 14th, the situation is very fluid here, of course. The banks that went under over the weekend, Signature Bank of New York and Silicon Valley Bank out in California, and the Fed was part of the, I guess, rescue committee to at least shore up the system with liquidity and make sure that the the depositors, all depositors, would be made whole. So the question is, what are the chances that the Fed reigns in QT or ends QT all right, in your view? Pretty high. So it's really going to depend on what we see in terms of the take up of the new facility. So the new facility that the Fed announced on Sunday night, the bank term financing program. And so what that effectively is, is a way for banks to transform their securities holdings into one year funding from the Fed at OAS plus 10. So pretty attractive rates, depending on kind of where the volatility in the front end settles, the curve's inverted. So for a lot of banks, you can take your underwater mortgages, you can put them to the Fed, you can take that funding at OAS plus 10, and you can park it in Fed funds, and you can pick up your 20, 30 basis points of carry on a riskless trade facing the Fed. So really, in terms of what it means for QT, as banks do that, that increases the amount of reserves in the system, which is effectively what QE does. Right. Um, obviously, it's only for a year long term, and so it should have a more mechanical roll off than QE would through QT. And so it really just depends on take up. And so, right. you know, I think the Fed might continue to roll down their balance sheet on one hand through QT, but if you see a lot of take up to this to this new uh, bank term. Um, I always get this acronym right, wrong as it's, as is the newest one. Uh, the BTFP. Yeah, yeah. It's like BTFD except for a P instead of a D. Exactly. So, uh, I I don't know if the Fed would like like to put it in that context. Probably not, but, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. So insofar as the BTFP starts to see a lot of take up, that'll materially offset the reserve drain that's coming from QT. And so. Right. You know, it's unclear. We'll start to get that data as of Wednesday close. So we'll get that on Thursday with the Fed's um, kind of weekly balance sheet release. And so, you know, we're kind of in the dark here over the next few days until we get more clarity on what's happening there. I don't expect it to fully offset what we're seeing with QT because most of the banks that are likely to use a facility like this don't hold that many securities. So it's largely regional banks where most of their assets are in loans, which aren't putable to this Fed facility. The banks that own a lot of these types of securities are the Bank of America, the JPNs, the cities of the world that are less likely to use it, probably for both 
you know, need that, you know, they're less under pressure over the last few days. And the other point is kind of the supervisory guidance behind the scenes that I, I'd be surprised that they're encouraging these larger institutions to tap these facilities unless they really need to. And so the other part of it is you've seen the FHLB systems of the federal home loan bank system that provides funding against real estate um, collateral. You've seen them issue a lot of debt yesterday. And I'd expect these regional banks to tap a lot more funding from the FHLBs because their balance sheets comprise a lot more of these real estate loans than they do of securities. Okay, very interesting. So it sounds like there are a lot of resources available there for the regional banks. Is it going to be enough to, I guess, save their business model here? Uh, because we've heard a lot about you know the flight to the big banks as a result of this and things like that. So what, what do you think about that? That, I mean, that's the long-term structural mm -hmm. question that regulators have to be dealing with mm -hmm. because, you know, there's a huge tail to the U.S. banking system. There's over 4,000 institutions, while most of the deposits are concentrated in, you know, the GSIBs, the, the JPMs, the Bank of Americas of the world. You know, there's very small community banks all over this country, and those have a lot of political implications for, you know, Congress to be thinking about if you're in a rural district and you're one local community bank that has you know, been in the community 40, 50 years, is failing for, for largely doing the right things. And I think you know, there can be some criticisms of Silicon Valley banks and signature banks, specific business models, Silvergates as well. Maybe they had too much in wholesale kind of business deposits. Maybe they got a little too far into crypto, had overly concentrated deposit bases. But for a lot of these regionals, they're just doing the fundamental basics of maturity transformation, which is what all banks do. And so in a world where you see this flight to quality to the largest GSIBs, you're basically unwinding a lot of the goals of the post-crisis regulatory framework, which was to make banks, individual banks, less systemically important. And so, you know, the last few days shows you that a bank that's in the top 20 of assets you know, nowhere near the top of the leaderboard in terms of total assets, Silicon Valley Bank fails. And then all of a sudden you see the FDIC needing to use a systemic risk exception to guarantee their deposits for Signature Bank as well. And so in a world where you then see that flight to quality to the JPMs of the world, you're just exacerbating the problems associated with a, a failure of a large institution going forward. And so I would expect more regulatory burden for those kind of category four um, banks. So that's kind of where Silicon Valley, um, Signature Bank, a lot of the regional banks fall in. So below $250 billion in assets that got some kind of, you know, lighter regulatory burden after the tailoring rules that the Fed and Congress um, implemented in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, whether Congress actually gets it done, I would expect more conversations about whether to reverse that, uh, those kind of tailoring rules going forward. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the issue of moral hazard here and the fact that you've you've bailed out depositors who uh, had nothing to do with this, obviously, they're just depositing their funds, but you still have an adjustment to the FDIC, I guess, mandate or whatever for these couple of banks and what that may introduce should other banks run into the same issue in the future? I mean, it certainly introduces more moral hazard mm -hmm. to depositors. I've been I've been wrestling with this over the last few days. So I, I, I it's hard to expect a lot of retail clients and small businesses to do the kind of credit risk underlying their banks. So I get in miniature, yes, there's there's moral hazard from bailing out specific depositors because there's that kind of implicit backstop for other bank depositors going forward. But kind of at, to a larger point, I don't know if we want to get to a point where people have to do that credit risk on their banks, right. where people have to incorporate that, where have to, people have to think actively about bank failures, have to think about moving their funds, diversify across banks, because there's a lot of inefficiencies to that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, there's a huge tension between those two things. And I, I'm not sure I can reconcile it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Finally, where does this leave interest rates? Uh, I know that's not wasn't your purview of the Fed, but w this um, you know with the Fed meeting next week, and could we maybe expect a QT, some QT language, QE language to make it into the into the the statement? And what? Yeah, what about interest rates? Yeah, so I would expect, given the strength of the CPI print for February this morning, that the Fed still wants to do 25 basis points. The kind of 50 basis points that they floated last week during Chair Powell's testimony, I think that's gone out the window with the bank volatility. Um, but I think going forward, 
you're still going to have this underlying kind of issue with the maturity and transformation that banks are doing. And because banks are now wary of that and the consequences of that, I think they're going to be less likely to less willing to lend going forward. Corporates are probably going to be a little bit more conservative. So I think, you know, there are going to be, you know, more permanent effects of this volatility, even if we get past it, that, you know, you're probably, you know, lowering demand in the, you know, the, you know, one, two, three quarters out, and you're probably pulling forward and increasing the likelihood of a recession. So I think it probably limits where we get in terms of the terminal rate, but I do think the Fed wants to hike at the March meeting, 25 basis points, probably another 25 in May. In terms of QT, I, I think they'll probably leave it ongoing. You know, the, the mortgage runoff is pretty limited just given where prepayments are. Treasuries are kind of on, you know, a fixed pace. And, you know, it's, you know that with, you know, absolute certainty going forward over the next few months. Kind of the next big decision may be for the May meeting, because that'll come before the Fed will have very large maturities from, because it's a quarterly refunding month based on kind of how Treasury issues debt. Um, so maybe they might start to talk a little bit more and give more guidance in remarks between the March and May meeting about what they're thinking about the level of reserves. They'll have more clarity in terms of the take up of the BTFP. Um, but I think for now, they don't want a surprise on that front at the March meeting. And they'll just say, hey, we'll see what happens with the BTFP. He'll take questions on that and talk about the aggregate level of reserves. Sick of me yet? Become a premium subscriber and avoid all ads or interruptions. Other benefits as well. Visit contrarian.supercast.tech for more information. What can you tell us about the past cycle, which sounds like it lasted from late 2015 through 2019, so about four years, and what kind of stuff you and the Fed were looking for? You touched on some of it, but before reversing course and how that process worked. Yeah, I mean, so the, the principal lesson was that we can do QT. Mm -hmm. It had never been done in the size that the Fed was trying in the beginning of at the end of 2017. We accomplished that goal. We ran down the balance sheet successfully. You know, you had some volatility towards the end, but by and large, it was a very successful program. Mm -hmm. And so when we started QT earlier this year, the Fed had the playbook. Markets had the playbook. They had an understanding of the effects, kind of the pace at which the Fed would be doing it. The Fed pre-announced kind of the sizes, a much, you know, a much more rapid pace of declines relative to 2017. And one, that was because of this learned experience. And then two, the balance sheet was far larger in 2022 than the comparative comparative period in 2017. Of course, because the size of the purchases in COVID were just so much of such a larger magnitude. And so that's kind of the principal difference is we had that learned experience. Mm. And then the Fed also changed their operating framework subtly in order to kind of put some guardrails around what we saw in late 2019. And so they introduced a standing repo facility. They introduced a FEMA repo facility. So these are additional ways for the Fed to achieve rate control when they're uncertain about the, what the right level of reserves in the system is. But there's mm -hmm. some kind of issues running the other way. And so because this rate hike cycle has been so rapid, mm -hmm. you've seen a big concentration of assets on the Fed's balance sheet. So that's a liability for the Fed in the form of the overnight reverse repo. Mm -hmm. So money funds, because interest rates increases have been so rapid, people are kind of hoarding money at the front end of the curve. And so they're saying, we don't want to extend duration. We don't want to extend out the curve because the interest rate path is so uncertain. We can park our money in the, you know, in a money fund who puts it on the Fed's balance sheet, gets that ONRP rate, you know, which is going to go right in line with um, Fed rate increases. And so now you have a much larger pool of money sitting on the Fed's balance sheet, which complicates the calculus around how much reserve balances should be in the system and when the appropriate end for QT is. So that's one complicating factor. Okay. Another one is the debt ceiling. Okay. So the debt ceiling is likely to bind in sometime in the fall. You know, I think the early end would be August. You know, if they get over a few tax dates, maybe that pushes it out to September. And so what that does as well is that also puts more reserves in the system. So as the Treasury Department spends down its cash, that's releasing reserves into the system as well. It's also pulling out other short-term investment op opportunities because the Treasury is going to be reducing the, the supply of bills. And so again, that's another complicating factor for how many bank reserves are likely to be in the system. And the other part of it is just how different the MBS market looks. Mm -hmm. And so today, 
because of how rapidly interest rates have increased, the Fed's stock of MBS securities are deeply out of the money. You know, they bought the bulk of those securities in 2020 when rates mm-hmm. were at two, two and a half percent. You get a 30 year mortgage at two and three quarters. Mm. And so what that means is you have to have a really sharp decline in interest rates in order for those MBS to start prepaying again. And so what that means is it slows kind of the passive process on the MBS side. So most of the rundown that's happening today is really coming through the treasury side in a world where the, the Fed funds rate is at 3%. You can only cut to zero. That only gives you about 300 basis points of cuts. Mm. And so that makes you know QE more likely. So it's really about the trajectory of long-term interest rates yeah. that matters for the probability of QE yeah. going forward. You say we can only cut to zero, but we saw other central banks that cut below zero. And uh, was there ever any talk about that being a possibility? And also, what about this, this concept that the Fed could buy stocks? Because they f- buy some bonds, obviously MBS, and some bonds. Were they corporate bonds? I don't even know. Yes, um, corporate bonds. They are. So, but yeah, was there ever any discussion about buying stocks? Yeah. So on on the negative interest rate story, mm-hmm. it, it's certainly you know there's public evidence of it. There's historical memos from FOMC meetings. They've clearly discussed mm-hmm. the possibility of negative interest rates. The big holdup in the U.S. is really about the money fund industry. Mm-hmm. So money market funds are a thing here and have a large stock of you know, short-term cash. And they, they run into difficulties in a world with negative interest rates because kind of they're priced to the buck. So you know, okay. we had this during the financial crisis. One of these large money funds broke the buck, yeah. if you will. And it caused a lot of havoc at the front end of the interest mm. rate market. And so you know, in other regimes, you know, Switzerland, you know, Scandinavia, um, Japan, there aren't these money fund frictions that kind of make um, negative interest rates a less palatable, palatable option here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, on equities, that's a far more difficult exercise. I think that's a uh, that would be a policy of last resort. We've really only seen the Bank of Japan do that, largely yeah. through ETFs. And right. the reason being, once you get away from the core government-backed securities, you're kind of going away from the, the legal document, you know, the the Federal Reserve Act and kind of the strictures there. And so you kind of need an emergency. It's called 13.3 authority. That allowed right. the Fed to do things like buy corporate bonds, the municipal um, funding facility, things like that. Buying equities, I think, is probably beyond the pale. And mm-hmm. so that would be in a world where they've already gone through all of these other exigent mm-hmm. um programs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And was there ever any serious discussion about that that you're privy to? No. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Good to know. So that, that, that'll kill some conspiracies right here. <laughs> very cool. All right. Jake Shermeyer of Harbor Capital. Very interesting com- conversation here about the Fed. I want to take a short break and come back, ask you some more about your background, about what you do at Harbor, and continue talking about Fed interest rate policy. Don't go anywhere. If you are a premium subscriber, do not touch the dial because we will be right back. In fact, we already are. And if you want to become a premium subscriber, sign up at the website, contrarianpod.substack.com. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contrarian Investor Podcast, where we give voice to those who challenge a prevailing narrative in global financial markets. Consider becoming a premium subscriber. For $9 a month or less, premium subscribers receive a number of benefits. Podcasts are posted immediately after they're recorded. Transcripts are made available within 24 hours. Premium subscribers get direct access to the host and access to private channels on our Discord server. They also get generous discounts to our virtual conferences and other services. And of course, there are no ads or interruptions. Visit contrarian.supercast.tech for more information. That's contrarian.supercast.tech. By the way, you don't need the .tech suffix to get to that website. .com will do the trick. And we also have a Substack that you can where you can sign up for the same prices, same benefits, same details, contrarianpod.substack.com. So if you already have a Substack account and use it, or have the app and use that, that's probably the best way to go. So contrarian.supercast.com 
or contrarianpod.substack.com. Whole bunch of benefits, including, of course, getting this episode up to a week early without ads or annoying announcements. And you also get the Daily Contrarian briefing and podcast that is released every market day morning at 7 a.m. This is a contrarian take on the events of the day ahead and what is likely to move markets, such as economic data releases, earnings, and other things. It is really good, and that is completely unbiased, of course. So check that out, contrarianpod.substack.com or contrarian.supercast.tech. Now on with the show. All right, welcome back, everybody. Here with Jake Schirmeyer of Harbor Capital. Jake, this is the segment of the show where we ask our guests to tell us a little bit more about themselves and their uh, entry, I guess, origin story to put things in Marvel terms and what they did in their career. We obviously know about the Fed already when you were there, but tell us about this, how you got interested in investing or economics or, or policy or all, any of these things and how this brought you to where you are today. Yeah, so I think it really started in grad school. I was doing a public policy degree. I spent a summer at the U.S. Treasury Department um, on their international side. That was during the first um, Russia invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And so it was a really kind of close um, experience with sanctions policy, with thinking about the intersection of macro policy and financial markets. We also did a lot of work. That's when they were winding down some of the um, Icelandic bank bailouts. You had kind of the remnants of the European sovereign debt crisis still ongoing, Spain, Portugal, thinking about capital markets there. And so I, I really enjoyed the intersection of kind of macro economics, kind of the, the core theory, thinking about trade, all of these things, and financial markets. And so how do you price those things? How are they intersecting? Mm. Kind of the reflexivity of the two. After grad school, I kind of landed at the Fed. And while there, of course, you know, I spent a number of years um, in financial markets and treasury markets specifically, I also spent a year at the Treasury Department in their Office of Debt Management, so the seller of treasury security. Mm. So thinking about the policy issues around do we issue more tips? What's the appropriate amount of bills? How do you think about kind of as a steward of the treasury market, the correct market structure, central clearing, those sorts of issues? And then, you know, I left the, the public sector in 2021 to become a fixed income portfolio manager where I've been um, for the last, you know, 16 months or so. Interesting. Pretty straightforward. The, uh, yeah, going back to the, the Fed here and the, all these uh, for QT, QE and stuff, one of the things that the Fed did you touched on it, this cycle and during COVID is uh, buy mortgages, MBS. And this was a little bit unorthodox just because the housing market wasn't really impacted by any of this, or maybe it was, maybe you can tell me differently. Uh, you know, the MBS market obviously imploded in 2008, 2009, and needed the Fed as a buyer of last resort, but possibly not so much in 2020. Um, and, you know, some of the criticism of the Fed that it exacerbates inequality, this could be one of the ways that, that people have pointed that it does so. So curious about your thoughts on all that. Yeah, I mean, I think you rightly said it. So 2008, 2009, it was clearly a crisis centered in the mortgage market. And insofar as that was reflected in the banking system. So buying mortgages, buying agency debt, you know, I think it was really hard to argue that that wasn't the nexus of the crisis. Come to 2020. It's really a small, it's really a business crisis. Mm -hmm. People are stuck at home. People can't spend. How are you going to keep people attached to the labor market? How are you going to keep kind of the economy moving in a world where people are stuck at home in a pandemic? So it was a far more kind of macro shock emanating from the real economy, far less driven by financial markets. But the Fed's kind of knee-jerk reaction and you know their ability to affect broader macro economy is really through interest rates. And so the treasuries are obviously kind of the benchmark interest rate for the world. They're going to set the price for corporates. They're going to set the price for equities, um, MBS, et cetera. But the pass-through is always kind of more nebulous, whereas the housing market and buying agency MBS securities, they can directly affect people's ability to buy homes. 
the costliness of homes, um, their ability to service debt, those sorts of things. And so kind of the knee jerk in, in March of 2020 was, hey, we've done this before. We have a lot of experience buying treasuries and agency MBS. Let's do it. And at the outset, one of the issues why we were buying securities was because of market functioning issues. Mm -hmm. Those were extremely clear in the treasury market and the MBS market. So it made a lot of sense from a market functioning purpose to buy in both of those markets. Fast forward a few months later though, the housing market had really started to recover. Mortgage prepayments were rising, mortgage refinancing activity was rising because interest rates were so low. People were restriking their debt, taking advantage of very low interest rates. All of the fiscal programs had really supported household balance sheets. And so I think there's a strong argument to be made that the QE that continued from there probably should have been more concentrated in treasury securities. Uh, Kristen Forbes, a professor, I believe at MIT, talked a little bit about kind of the unequal distribution of QE coming out of the COVID pandemic. And so really focused on MBS securities in particular and how those may have exacerbated some of the housing price increases that we saw coming out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And as you know, people who own their homes generally you know, skew a little bit wealthier, higher credit scores, um, have more household net worth just by virtue of owning those homes. And so insofar as there's an argument to be made about QE kind of exacerbating inequality because it directly affects financial net worth, buying MBS and supporting the housing market kind of disproportionately benefited those wealthier households. Mm -hmm. I think the Fed's counter argument would have been, this was a crisis. We mm -hmm. were doing everything we could. We have shown the efficacy of buying MBS securities. And that was kind of an easy lever to pull before they could stand up all the 13.3 facilities. And I think that's a really valid counter argument. Mm -hmm. I think where I differ a bit is it probably didn't make sense to be continuing buying right. MBS in 2021. But again, we're playing Monday morning quarterback here. Yeah, and there was awesome. a lot of uncertainty about the counterfactual. How fast would the US economy recover? How willing would people be to spend? How, how could you think about job security in that environment? And so the main lesson for the Fed coming out of the financial crisis was to do things fast and to err on the side of doing too much because mm -hmm. the recovery from the financial crisis was pretty slow and it was you know bumpy and they had to do successive rounds of QE. And so kind of the lesson there was let's front load it, let's do more now because we can always raise interest rates later to offset some of those effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk about the speed with which the Fed operates and it's, it's curious that they, they do send, tend to act pretty quickly and they have to. And that would normally lead one to believe it's a pretty top-down heavy organization um, just because somebody has the authority to make those decisions. But it's kind of not. You have all these committees and things. And so I'm, I'm curious about the decision-making process and how long that takes. Because on the corporate side, when you want to make some of these decisions, it takes months of meetings and blah, 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 meetings about meetings and all this horrible stuff that hopefully no, nobody ever has to experience, but probably most of us do. Another story for another day. But at the Fed, how, yeah, how top down is it? How does that whole thing work? How quickly are decisions made? Yeah. So it really depends. Um, mm. A crisis really has a way of concentrating the mind. And so yeah. I think, you know, we went from, doing these reserve management purchases in February, early March of 2020, to all of a sudden do an open-ended $75 billion per day by March, you know, 17th, later, uh -huh. you know, on, only three weeks later. And so the, the crisis necessitated it. And so the Fed was able to kind of, you know, take off some of the guardrails in terms of thinking about how do we size these programs? How do we think about the liquidity effects? How do we think about success in this environment? Because we know we can't do too much. And so let's take those away. Where it gets into the 13.3 facilities, it gets more difficult. So buying corporate bonds um, in the secondary market, the primary market, municipal securities. And that's why you saw a lot of those things come later in March early April. And so those are, those take the lawyers, those take a lot more kind of right. structuring because they, they're not as directly specified by the Federal Reserve Act. And so, but I think to your general question, yes, the Fed is a consensus driven committee organization. Yeah. And so the chair sets the tone, sets sure. the research agenda and the staff and all the reserve banks kind of work towards that. But a crisis, you, you throw that all out yeah. of the way. You say, what can we do quickly and effectively? Mm -hmm. And so in March 2020, that was buying Treasury and Agency MBS securities. That was you know opening up the repo facilities, doing all those things. And so mm -hmm. you know 
what I think the lessons of coming out of the financial crisis is, you know, they, they reflect on those. And so mm-hmm. six, seven years of thinking about, okay, what are the guardrails for future crises? What are kind of other programs we left on the cutting room floor mm-hmm. that we need to think about? And so the Fed's always doing that prep, always thinking about these exigent circumstances and what they might be able to do. Um, mm-hmm. So that that preparation is always ongoing, but a crisis just, you know, causes yeah. them to shift into gear. Yeah, very interesting. And also related to that and what, what we talked about um, so far this half of the program, what do you make of the argument that the Fed has become too meddlesome and too prominent in financial markets and that you know has maybe had a part, maybe a large part in creating some of these bubbles that we've seen and that really if the Fed would just kind of leave things alone, maybe let some more of these banks fail, maybe they should have in 08, and then it might be better for the long term. Um, yeah, curious about that. And if there's people inside the Fed that actually advocate for that at all. Yeah. So I think policymakers would agree generally that Mm -hmm. they want to be doing less. They want to have a less active uh, part to play in financial markets. They believe in markets. You know, these are a a large organization of economists. They believe that markets are efficient Mm -hmm. by and large, that they come to good outcomes. And so they would agree that the Fed's footprint has probably been too large, but that's not by their choice. And so mm-hmm. we didn't see much fiscal spending coming out of 20, 2008, 2009. And that's kind of the classic response to get out of a low interest rate environment, to get out of a zero lower bound a li- a liquidity trap. W- whereas in COVID, we saw that. We saw that fiscal spending. And I think Fed policymakers would hope that we have more of that counter cyclical fiscal spending. I think the experience since COVID with high inflation, with you know, the ongoing bickering um, between the two parties about the the appropriate role for fiscal policy, the size of the national debt. I would be skeptical that we'll probably get such a large counter cyclical fiscal response in future crises um, because the pandemic was so unique. And it was it was very hard to argue that people who are staying home for their health reasons should be, you know, unable to afford food, unable to keep the lights on, unable to heat their homes because they're staying home for a national emergency. Right. And so I think that really concentrated the fiscal authorities as well. Right. And so I, I, I would expect in future shocks, we're probably not going to get quite as much counter cyclical fiscal spending. And that's going to probably force the Fed to step back in again, because yeah. at the end of the day, one of the lessons from the financial crisis was that long recoveries lead to poor recoveries. Yeah. It, it gets people out of the labor force. It causes them to lose their skills. It get, makes labor markets less dynamic going forward. It's called this, it's a concept called hysteresis. And the Fed really wants to mm-hmm. avoid that. And so that's why they do as much as they can Understood. as quickly as they can. One thing I want to ask you about the Fed, if I could, and, and this is we, you know, the whole scandal last year and the year before about the inside the um, Fed central bankers buying stocks or in, or uh, indexes or whatever it was. I'm curious what, what if anything, you were required to disclose. Because I asked this because working on a news desk where I had very, very little access to inside information, like maybe a couple times, but I had to disclose, I had to give my employer access to my brokerage account, basically full transparency into anything that I was doing. And that that's me on a news desk where, again, I had very little uh, but at the Fed, I mean, they literally set policy, but yet they don't seem to be required to do any of that stuff. Or is that wrong? That That is wrong. So they there okay. are pretty strict requirements. They have changed them subsequent to some of the issues um, with the Fed presidents over the past uh, three years. Um, you know, Chair Powell has talked a little bit about this, and I think they publicly disclosed what the new requirements are for senior officers and you know presidents and board members. But when I was there, and I think this has been the case in the markets group for a very long time, because we were actually implementing policy, so we had a little more access relative to the rest of the system in terms of what policy decisions are, are likely, um, how the Fed's buying treasuries, and MBS, et cetera, we had pretty strict requirements in terms okay. of we needed to disclose what we were buying, when we were buying it, um, we had to hold it for a certain amount of time. We need to disclose when we were selling it. We weren't trading options. We weren't buying individual right. treasury securities, MBS. There were pretty strict requir- requirements yeah. about what we could buy, how long we had to hold it for. So, you know, I think the vast majority, it's, you know, you're buying some ETFs. You're holding right. those for a very long time as a very vanilla um, investment strategy, I think. Yeah, um, which is basically all. Yeah. So it sounds like similar to what we had too. Yeah. But 
But the the Fed, I mean, I guess that's all they did. The the bank, the central bankers just bought they bought indexes. But maybe it was a timing of it that people were. But then people in 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 government don't have to do that apparently, like senators and congressmen. That's a different story, of course, and you don't know that uh, about that. Um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, do you think that should there should be some kind of a blanket policy there? I mean, in in government as well as at the Fed and elsewhere for people to have to disclose some of that stuff. Yeah, I think it, I think it's right. It's just it, the Fed is a public institution yeah. who gets its remit from Congress, who okay. you know works on behalf of the American people. I think it's it's a great thing for them to be transparent about the rules around what they can buy and sell, and that they're not privileging themselves at the expense of you know the American people. And I think mm-hmm. the Fed, you know, I, I, I'm obviously biased here as a former Fed person, and you know, uh, very close to that organization. Um, I, I think that organization as a principle really tries to abide by that to be transparent to um, follow the rules to make to kind of put themselves above reproach and I think the the recent um, issues with a few of the reserve bank presidents their their quick you know re- resignations I think show that the Fed takes it very seriously Powell himself I, I think is someone who really upholds himself um, yeah. and really is responsive to the American people yeah fair points fair points very interesting all right. Jake Schurmeyer, thank you so much for joining the Contrarian Investor Podcast today. Very fascinating conversation. In closing, uh, maybe you can tell our listeners how they can find out more about you, more about Harbor Capital, and I'll put this information in the show notes as well. Great, Nathaniel. Uh, So Harbor Capital, we are a major um, provider of active ETFs and mutual funds. Um, You can go to our website, harborcapital.com, and to see more about us. For me, um, you know, I, I put a number of you know market insights onto our website. Not a big social media presence, um, so you'll just have to follow me through the official channels. But you know, this has been a wonderful time. Really appreciate speaking with you, and you know, look forward to doing it again in the future. Yeah, fascinating conversation. Look forward to having you on again as the cycle turns here. That will be very cool indeed. So yeah, thanks so much, Jake. Thank you all for listening, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. See you then. Thank you for listening to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To subscribe to this podcast, simply open your favorite podcast software and search for Contrarian Investor. Follow us on social media by searching for Contrarian Investor on Twitter and Instagram. Send us your thoughts on feedback at contrarianpod.com. We look forward to speaking to you again next time.